Hi, this is Gary Auden, and I have an Educast sponsored by Bicom Systems and Telecom Reseller. And it's an interesting title, How to Start and Grow an Internet Telephony Service Provider. And you may ask yourself, why should I be interested? Well, it turns out not everyone wants to be a VoIP provider and do only that business. You might be a VAR, you might be a reseller, a managed service provider that has some interest in getting into the ITSP business. But think of this as well. You service medical or dental or accounting firms or legal firms, and to hold on to them, you may want to add voice over IP services as part of the package to retain them as clients. So the number of companies wanting to become ITSPs has actually grown considerably over the last few years. Today, I'm Gary Auden, and with me is Catherine Lloyd, Lead Generation and Handling Manager at Bicom Systems. And she and I will be talking about these subjects. How do you approach the market? Delivering a solution that will win. But let's talk about the problems you have as you go down this road, the bumps in the road. And then lastly, how do you grow this business? So let's start off with the first slide. There's two markets, residential and business. How do we think about those two? Thank you, Gary, by the way. So comparing a residential market to a business market, when you're looking at a residential market, you have to compete with the incumbents, so the big guys, more or less. Unless you have a niche that you're, you can sell to, it's really, really hard to break into that market. Um, we did have a customer in Spain, and he had a great success with selling residential service to English expatriates because they were people who had a need that needed to be filled by a particular solution, and it was a large enough market that he was able to grow it. Uh, for business markets, there is a lot of opportunity, and they have a high commitment because changing anything over is a project. However, to get that initial sale and to keep them with you, you need to offer them everything they need now and everything they think they might need in the future. And you need to back up everything you promise. I have a question here because you didn't mention the word, but it seems like you're saying the residential market might have a higher turnover than the business market. Is that true? Um, in our experience, it absolutely does. When you think about your own home phone, it's easy enough for you to call somebody up and say, you know, I like the deal that you put in my mailbox. Can you be here on Tuesday to switch my lines over? And they're more likely to say yes. With a business customer, there are enough phones that you do have to put a little bit of thought into it because changing your phone system is going to require the possibility of your current phones not being compatible or the need for a new UC. Now let's move on to another difference that's brought up. Remote locations or metropolitan, Where what's the competition like in these two areas? Remote locations are a little bit interesting. There aren't as many companies that can service them in the way that they need. So one good approach that we found has been focusing your business on actual connectivity because that's something that they have issues with out there and adding voice on as a bonus and being that person that can give them that all-in-one solution. For metropolitan areas, there is a lot of competition because everybody's in that market. So you need to have a very high quality offering because essentially everybody else does. When you say high quality, what would you include in that? For me, high quality is something that's stable, something that's reliable, something that is backed up by your support staff and something that has all of the features your customers could possibly need. Um, we keep going back to this, but unified communications is key in businesses in particular. If you're not capable of offering that, that's something that might prevent you from closing those deals that you're looking at. The next slide intrigues me because you're differentiating government from the rest of business. What's make it different dealing with the government trying to sell this kind of service? Yeah. Well, the government likes to set themselves apart to begin with. Um, they, when you're looking at government contracts, there is not a lot of wiggle room. So when they send you that strict budget, chances are you're not going to be able to move anywhere above that. They need a lot of references, and they need you to prove these references. And we've actually had some customers that have been very successful by being able to leverage references and experiences that we've had to show in particular how our software has done the job that these bids have needed. 
let's move on to the word competition. And that's really going to be an issue here because there's so many people who could be in this business and you have to deal, as you said earlier, with the incumbents. How do we deal with competition? Yeah. All right. Um, to deal with competition, you need to look at what they're doing. So look at what they're selling, what they feel their product is. So if you have a competitor, for example, and their whole thing is that they can give you a business phone for $15 a month, look hard at that and look hard at what that extension is for $15 a month because that might be what you need to move in behind them. Um, find out what they give away for free. So anything that they have bundled in, any extras. Another thing you need to consider with your competition is whether or not what you're competing for is their primary source of revenue. Because that might mean that they don't have the same focus on that particular service as you do. There's another point I think is important, and I've always wondered about this. Should I sell through someone else or should I sell direct? In one way, selling through someone else, they have the marketing costs. But if I sell direct, I actually have higher profit. What are the differences for you? Yeah. So. This comes down to one of those basic tenets of business. You sell a lot for a little or you sell a little for a lot. So you need to take a good hard look at your market and what your potential sales are as well as your own structures. So if you're interested in a, in a channel distribution model, you need to have the structure in place to support that so that you can have these large amounts of sales with a little bit less profit that's going to even out in the end where with direct selling, it's a lot more nitty gritty. You have full control over essentially the product, the profits, as well as how you're selling and who you're selling to. We're talking about telephone service, and for a lot of people that seems to be a commodity. But I think features still matter, do you agree? Oh, very much so. And Features are one of those things that um, once you have it, you can't take it away. I don't know if you've ever bought a car with heated seats, for example. Once you have them, you have a very hard time buying a car after that that doesn't have heated seats because you miss it. So one thing we do recommend is that you concentrate on having a full set of features because that's what's really going to keep your customers with you. If they know that if they would like to move somewhere, that they're going to lose something that they've become accustomed to. For example, uh, dynamic conferencing or uh, forwarding to your mobile phone. If they're going to lose that convenience, that's going to be something that's going to factor heavily into their decision. It's also really important to stay ahead of the trends, and that's when you come to that uh, phrase that once you hear about something, it's already on the way out. You don't want to be at the tail end selling something that people are going to be moving on from. You want to know about things before they're, before they're asked for. That way you can be the very first and you have that control. Now, we've talked about the selling side. Let's talk more about what's in, more in the back office. And I think planning for inventory and wholesale provisioning is going to be very important because that gets into your whole support structure. Mm -hmm. So. Try to scale your inventory to what your sales are. And that's for both your physical inventory as well as an inventory of DIDs, for example. Your physical inventory, I mean, there's the obvious statement that if you have too much on hand, it's going to take up a large amount of space that you could better use. But if you don't have enough on hand, that could slow down your deployments and setups of customers, which is going to leave a bad taste in their mouth. With DIDs, ideally you want to make it so that you have enough to deploy your next customer, but not so much that they're sitting there and you're paying for them. That moves into our next slide, which really gets into this whole set of support issues. And I like your comment here. Even four to five customers can be difficult instead of just saying only the big ones will be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, time is Time is money, and you have to think about your staff. If you're sending people out constantly to be doing things manually or even doing things manually in the office, that really adds up. If it's taking you, say, 15 minutes to provision a phone or 10 minutes to set up a DID for a customer, that adds up to a day very quickly. Uh, what you need to look at is actually automation. You want to be able to trust your automation to do invoicing, DIDs, shopping cart, and add-ons, but you want to make sure that the automation is doing so correctly. You don't want to hit a button to create mistakes. 
there's another point here which a lot of people sort of put later, and that's what what do I need to know about managing roots and rates? Managing your roots and rates is very important. It is a large job. So if you have a lot of customers, many large providers do need staff that are dedicated just to managing roots and rates. You need to make sure they're protected as well. The people that or the companies that you're using to source your roots, it's very important that they are trusted, that they are stable, because losing your roots and losing your DIDs overnight can be a nightmare. I think the next slide actually should have the word strategic on it as well, because when you select a switch, it's not the kind of thing you're gonna take and swap out and put another one in. Let's focus on what's important about the switch. Yeah, you're right. You, you really can't just swap between switches like you would a new cell phone. You want something that has as many features as possible, whether or not you want to make those available to every single customer, you need to make sure that they're available to you so that in the future you can have them. It needs to be something that's scalable from the ground up. And what that means is you want something that if you're just, if you're listening to this today and you're thinking, you know, I think I could do this, I, but I'm not really sure how quickly I can ramp up. You want something that's good for you today while you get your first 50 customers and something that's good for you in five years when you hopefully have 5,000. One thing that needs to be considered is that while free options do technically work, they require a high competency from your staff, and you really need to consider both the man hours and the price for that staff against the price of something that is, say, warranted and guaranteed. Let's continue discussing the switch, but now we're talking about the important things about you as a business offering this service and depending on the switch. Yes. So your infrastructure is unbelievably important. It's really the skeleton of your offering. Um, for redundancy, the, you have options for hardware, dual location, or cloud redundancy. Security is also very important. I feel security sometimes is ignored. Um, using a firewall or a session border controller, you can keep your information and your customer's information safe, and you can avoid those nightmare crashes. Let's talk about phones. If I'm in a, a company that already has a bunch of phones, I really don't want to buy new phones. That could be half the cost of my VoIP implementation. Should we have choices, mm -hmm. or are you going to be forced into phones that only come from one vendor? Well, I mean, ideally, you want hands. You want uh, a switch that's going to support almost every vendor, because not only do you have to worry about pricing, but you have to worry about your customers' preferences as well. As we all know, there are people who are committed to brands, and you might come across a customer who will never touch a phone that isn't a Polycom, for example, and you have to be able to deal with that. Um, another option is actually soft phones. A lot of people are moving away from their desk phones now. So ideally what you want is something that's going to have a fully integrated soft phone client that um, uses the appropriate codecs to give you that desk phone quality over your PC. You know, things don't always work right. And I always like the word missteps. It's, it's kind of PC. <laughs> Nice, it doesn't say failure, but failures do come. What do we have to think about here? Yeah. Um, one thing you need to think about is switch failure. It is the number one problem. So if your switch goes down, you can essentially consider your service down. Ideally, what you want is something that you can trust. Um, failed security is number two, and that's on a lot of ends. Um, your customers, for example, you want to make sure that people can't access their phones without the appropriate credential. You want to make sure that people can't access your system without the appropriate credentials. Disruptions to call quality come from almost anywhere. So that could be a hardware failure. It could be a failure of broadband. It could be virtually anything, and you want to be able to pinpoint where it's coming from so you can take care of that as quickly as possible. When I look forward, and one of the issues that I have in my mind is, how do I keep up with what's going on? On the other hand, if I don't mm -hmm. look forward, I become a commodity and I have very little to distinguish myself. 
the way you need to look at it is everything is sitting right there waiting for you. All you have to do is take a look at your strengths, what you bring that other people don't have, because everybody has something. And by everybody, I mean every individual and every business has something that they do differently. Do your research. Understand your market. Understand the um, industry. And understand your competition. And from the very first, you should be future-proofing your business. So making sure that you're set up to grow. When you say grow, and you mentioned the word scalable earlier, why is that so mm -hmm. important? Um, scalability is incredibly important. Um, I don't think there are any, very many businesses that from the first day they open their doors to 10 years down the road can honestly say that they're the same business. So there needs to be a little bit of flexibility and there needs to be an ability to very easily grow. For example, you might start off and you might start off with 50 customers and you can very easily invoice all of those customers manually each month. But when you have 250 customers, can you still invoice them manually? You want to know that whatever you're using, particularly for your switch, has something that you can purchase that will do that for you. Um, another thing too is unlimited extensions and tenants. That is something that a lot of people don't think about. There are so many licensing models. Uh, I will admit that we have multiple licensing models as well. We try to fit into whatever people want. Having the ability to have multi unlimited extensions and tenants will really limit your potential customer base to what your hardware can support. And that is freeing in a way. One of the points I think is important is that you need to keep adding value to what you offer so that you can keep contacting the client and keep, in a sense, the sell process going. One thing that I kind of, this is something that I, I like to talk about is the soft touch. So it's not, um, it's not calling somebody up and outright saying, how are we doing? What are we doing wrong? Are you looking at somebody else? A soft touch is more calling somebody for a reason and really getting a gauge of that. So when you have new technologies, so say you have a UC client, or you're now able to offer a mobile app. That gives you an opportunity to call your customer and not only at that moment add more to what they're receiving, but find out what they think of what they're already receiving. Okay, circling back to that add value leads into the next point, and that's future-proofing you. Seems like you have to have some continuous innovation going on, not just simply servicing the client with what you've offered in the past. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, nobody's interested in what they had five years ago. Everything's moving, and you need to move with it. So keep an eye on the current trends. Again, I have to say, unified communications is huge. Mobile apps, integration with key business products, so CRM, mail clients. So what you want to look for is a partner that is doing this for you, somebody that's constantly trying to innovate their product, and in turn innovate your product. I think of customer loyalty in your next screen, and I think one of the most important points of the people listening is when you lose a customer, it may actually cost you more to get them back than it costs you to, to market in the first place. Lose the loyalty and then you've lost the business. Do you agree? Absolutely, I do. Um, one, one of the best ways to get that commitment from your customer is all-inclusive solutions. So the more they depend on you for, and that's the more products they depend on you for, the more likely they are to stay with you. Custom solutions are another, another approach. Having the ability to customize something to exactly what they need is going to really keep you, not only is it going to make the customer appreciate what you've done for them, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for them to move on and replace you with somebody else who is less likely to be able to do that for them. And Nourishing partners after the sale. When they say call them before they call you, it is very key. Keep, a touch, keep in touch with your customers because the ones who call you complaining aren't the ones you really need to worry about because you know what their problem is. You can fix that right then. The people who aren't calling you at all, the ones that you aren't talking to, 
much like dating, if you're not talking to them, they might be talking to somebody else. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to point out there are three resources that are important. In fact, this is a company that wrote the book, which is on the left hand side. We've done Educast with Bicom Systems in the past, and their product line is actually Telco in a Box, which is a total package. If you need to contact Bicom Systems, this is some of the information available to you. And I'd like to thank you very much for participating in this Educast. Thank you so much, Gary.